the, the rape culture trope depends heavily on baseless moral panic to push feminist claim that one in four or five depends on your source. Campus women are raped every year. If such a statistic were true, no parents would permit their daughters to attend co-ed universities. But though the mainstream media fails to address the yawning disparity in actual statistics, even if you multiply them by 10, because, oh, women don't report rape. Okay, so let's multiply the figures by 10. Still doesn't come anywhere close to the, to the bogus figures that they're telling us. Ordinary people know in their hearts this is not true and that the vast majority of female students alleging rape on campus are actually voicing buyer's remorse for alcohol-fueled promiscuous behavior involving murky lines of consent on both sides. It's true. Uh, it's, it's, it's their get-out-of-guilt-free card, you know, like a monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> to say so, however, to say so, however, uh, involves blowback of a kind every editor dreads so it is easier to remain stum or add one's voice to the chorus of his entry. At this point, I must give a little shout out to my own newspaper, the National Post, because on this subject, as on many others uh, that are politically correct, I have never been muzzled in any way, no matter how many feminists protest. My editors agree with me, in fact, on much of what I write, and a recent addition to the editorial board, a very bright young woman, uh, did that. But, uh, first of all, the coverage of the recent massacre of seven fellow students at Santa Barbara by the deeply disturbed Elliot Roger. Uh, a Twitter feed instantly sprang up, yes, all women, um, to brand the killing as a crime of misogyny that was indicative of a cultural pattern. But the killer was a psychologically twisted loner who viewed all of life through his own uh, self-pitying lens. In Roger's case, he hated women because they rejected him sexually, but he also hated men because they had access to women. They were his rivals. In his fantasies, he decimated the male population to get to rid himself of his rivals, but that was glossed over in the media reports and commentary. The Yes All Women campaign used a newish social platform to express exactly the sentiments the media ruited after the 1989 Montreal massacre of 14 women by Mark Lapine, another disturbed loner. Uh, the Montreal Massacre got international attention precisely because it was virtually unique in the annals of mass murders in conspicuously singling out women. Uh, if you Google uh, mass murders of only women, uh, you'll get the Montreal Massacre. That's all you'll get because women aren't massacred as a rule uh, or ever except for that. Every year on December 7th, the anniversary, uh, rituals are performed all over Canada, and the media solemnly reports on them while the punditocracy waxes lugubriously on the scourge of violence against women that the massacre supposedly represents. Uh, well, we have an elegant sufficiency of examples to show that when bad things happen to uh, girls and women, it's news, and when bad things happen to boys and men, not so much. And now I, I do refer to uh, Tara's uh, uh, mention of the Boko Haram uh, tragedy and the capture of hundreds of Christian schoolgirls in Nigeria who were subjected to forced marriages or sold into the sex trade. Uh, of course, this produced the great indignation in the West and the uh, hashtag bring back our girls with frowny Michelle Obama looking. Forgotten in the kerfuffle was, of course, uh, the fact that weeks earlier Boko Haram had killed dozens of boarding school boys, some being burned alive in their dormitories. Uh, when I pointed this out in a blog post, my deputy editor, a foreign news junkie, confessed he had not even heard of the incident. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I personally don't think the capture of the schoolgirls was an act of misogyny, and I also don't think the killing of the schoolboys was what you call an act of misandry. The Nigerian story is about religious he hegemony, not gender. Both were acts of terrorism to intimidate Christians into accepting the triumphalist future of Islam in Nigeria. That the girls were subjected to sexual humiliation and the boys to death is commensurate with behavioral drivers in all warring situations, which is why 8,000 boys and men were killed in Srebrenica by Bosnian Serbs in 1995, and why vengeful Russian soldiers raped virtually every girl and woman in their path to Berlin at the end of World War II. But, of course, if you are brainwashed into seeing only acts of violence against women, you're bound to assign misogyny as the motivation for them. What, for an example, is an editor to do with a story of shockingly sadistic, intimate partner violence that does not stack up against the politically correct paradigm of male on female? 
I'm not referring to female on male violence. That doesn't get reported. Uh, I'm speaking of a case of homosexual intimate partner violence. In the media, you'll never go wrong by observing one simple rule about gays. For feminists, they are honorary women. <laughs> since they are the natural victims of heterosexual men, and therefore, in the media, gays may as well be women, considering the editorial slant they are usually given. Motherhood, motherhood does feature large in these magazines, but it's usually in the context of the stress it involves. <laughs> For their socially conservative readers, the magazine always has wonderful recipes and a story about the deep personal reflection that accompanied uh, the decision to have an abortion. Not the right to have an abortion. That is never discussed. That is never discussed in the women's magazine. There are no arguments ever against having an abortion, but it's the stress, the emotional stress. You can stress about that. Health anxiety is as it's stoked in these pages. Um, at one point, American women's magazines peddled the myth created by Gloria Steinem and that Naomi Wolf that 150,000 women die of anorexia every year. Think about that. <laughs> die of anorexia? That's a lot of... The actual figure is 100. <laughs> uh, now, I also see changes in the media that, that may be subtle, but I think they are positive. Uh, for example, in my tenure at the Post, I'm now in my 12th year there, I have seen at least four or five aggressively feminist, often cruelly misandrous female columnists uh, none of our women, of course, my, my newspaper would never have anyone of such uh, a description. At, no, but the other newspapers, uh, the Globe and Mail and the Toronto Star, which are the other two huge um, Canadian newspapers, there's at least four or five very cruelly misandrous female columnists who have left their jobs, and none of them willingly. One was retired, uh, one was actually fired, one was, you know, they sort of uh, struck a deal. Um, and one in particular, uh, and one in particular was, who was the, one of the star writers of the Globe and Mail, she was producing Ms. Anders' writing of such viciousness uh, that she was fired, not only for that, and has subsequently, she was a columnist at Chatelaine Magazine, this magazine I spoke of, uh, and not by chance, I think, you know, sometimes you think you can leave it a good, uh, not by chance, I wrote an article about Chatelaine Magazine, and I said, you have two, I said, Chatelaine Magazine has two regular columnists, both of them are ardent feminists, and that's one too many. Can't you find somebody else that would, like, be a counterweight? Uh, shortly after that, I'm not saying it, me, just saying, shortly after that, she was let go, and now she's only writing online. Uh, which I think is a tremendous uh, advance because she truly was a star. 